All right. So continuing on with our other collection operations, here's a list of other things that we generally can do with our collections. Deleting is pretty obvious, but deleting doesn't permanently delete your collection. It sends it to the trash area of your account. And you can go into that trash area and um, restore your collection from there, or you can go and purge it for good. You can make collections of favorites that will move them to the top of your collection list. You can filter on your collections so you can search for a particular request. You can add scripts for dynamic behavior. Uh, you can run the collection to test your whole API or test all your requests within that collection. We'll be doing that in the afternoon session. You can also export and import collections as well. So I'll demonstrate some of these. I'm going to switch to a different workspace temporarily. Let me go to Postman Expert Dev. So this one has a, a few more collections here. To make it a favorite, you can simply tick that star symbol when you highlight over it. And what that does is it moves it to the top of your list. So when you display your list of collections, the favorites are displayed first at the top, followed by the rest of your collections. There's a filter on the top that you can use if you want to look for specific requests. Let's say I type in booking. So now I'm only seeing the requests that have the word booking in it. I'm not seeing anything else. So that's uh, favoriting. The delete option, you'll find that down at the bottom. I won't actually delete this, but once you do delete, you can see there's a trash link. If you click on that, it'll open up, and you can see what collections you have in here. So I'll come back to that once it loads. But these are some of the other operations. Now, with exporting, you can export a collection to a JSON file. And this file has all of the data and the metadata that's needed to import a collection. So you could export your collection, give it to your team, and they can import it. And that's a simple way of sharing a collection. So, you'll f so here's my trash area with all these collections. And I can restore it, or I can permanently delete from here. But I won't. I won't touch any of those. Um, let's go back to the application. So I'll switch back to my fundamentals workshop now. So on that drop down, I have the export options. And when you export, you can choose a particular version. It's generally recommended that you use the latest version, which is 2.1. If you want to learn more about the technical differences between collection versions, you can click on that link there. And once you have that file, you can do an import of the collection as well. And you can do that from this link up here, import, and import from a file. Just choose that collection file, and it'll set up a collection for you in your current workspace. So that's exporting and importing. And that's a breakdown of the collection. So we know that collections help us to organize our requests in, each API, in, in our APIs. Uh, and we use folders to further break down that level of organization. We can define common authorization credentials at both the folder level and at the collection level. Any questions? Yep. I was just wondering, if importing and exporting collections of authorization, are, are you enabling people to import a collection that you may have saved authorization in? Yes. So if you, if you did save authorization, they would import that as well. OK. So let's take a look at variables and environments. This is where we'll start to get into the more detailed functionality. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the different levels of scope with our variables. It's important to understand um, scoping, and also where we can use our variables as well. We'll configure the variables and configure the environments where we'll set the values of our variables, talk about some best practices for using environments, and the benefits of using variables in general. So let's start with the variables. Now, I'm going to start with the levels of scope. In Postman, there are five levels of scope for our variables. You have global, collection, environment, local, and data. So a global variable 
is a variable that has a value within a particular workspace. So you define it for the entire workspace. A collection variable is one that is specific to a collection. So you define that variable in the collection, and its value only applies to that collection. An environment is a portable scope for our variables, and I'll talk about environments in a bit more detail in the next upcoming slides. Local variables are used um, in your execution of test scripts, so you define them in your scripts. And data variables are only used if you upload a data file when running a collection with the collection runner. In this session, we're only going to look at our global collection and environment variables. Local variables we'll sort of look at a little bit when we write some test scripts, uh, and data variables we don't deal with in this session. This diagram gives us an illustration of those five levels of scope. It also illustrates which scope or which level takes precedence. Now, Postman resolves variables by basically going from the broadest to the narrowest scope. So what that means is, let's say I have a variable defined at the global level, and then I also have that same variable defined in my environment. Which value is Postman going to use? Is it going to take the value of the variable from the global level or the environment? It will take the environment one because that is the narrower scope. So the narrower scope always takes precedence over the broader scope. And variables can be used in most areas of our request builder that uses text. So your URL, your parameters, your header values, your form data, raw body content, all of those areas we can use variables. So here is an example of using variables within the request URL. So let's go and set that up. Now, that open weather API request that we did earlier on, where we had our API key specified, we're going to build on that, and we're going to replace certain elements of our requests with variables instead. So here was my open weather request. You can also find that from your history as well. Just look for open weather. And Let's go and replace this domain name, api.openweathermap.org, with a variable called base URL. So the syntax for defining or specifying a variable is basically the name of the variable and surround it with two curly brackets, a pair of curly brackets on either side. So that 2.5 there, I'm going to put a variable called API version. Where we have Q equals to Sydney, I will replace Sydney with a variable called city. And then the app ID, instead of specifying the value, I will put in a variable called API key. So I'm going to define that. And I will save this request into a new collection called Open Weather API. And we'll call that request the get weather by city. So let's save this. Get weather by city. It's actually getting the current weather, not a forecast. Now, when I scroll down, you can see that I'm in, the, in that RESTful Booker collection that I've been working with throughout this session. Let's go back all the way to the top level. We're not going to save to that collection. We're going to create a new collection. So I'll create a new one called open weather API. And then I'll choose that collection and save there. So here's my open weather API with the get weather by city. And that's the, that's the new request that I have. Now, you can see that if I hover my cursor over those variables, it will say that these are unresolved. And that's fine for now, because in the next exercise, we'll go and define some values. So right now, we, don't, we have. We've specified where we want to use our variables. We haven't defined any values for them yet. We'll do that in the next exercise. So let's get that set up, and let me know if you have any questions there. So where do we define those values for our variables? Well, one possible place is by using an environment. So as I mentioned before, an environment is like a, a portable scope for our variables. You can define the environment, and you can use that environment across different requests. Now, environments can be shared. You can share them between different workspaces. They'll be synchronized as well if you do that. You can also export and import environments as well. 
the data that's stored in environment is secured. So things like passwords and API keys, you can store that there. Although there is a little caveat to that, and I'll explain that when I talk a bit more about um, how you configure values in an environment. So environments are ideal for data that needs to be moved around. And before we go and define the data in an, or define the values of our variables in an environment, there's another concept we need to understand that's really important, and that is the concept of sessions. Sessions give us a way to store variable values that are unique to every Postman user and stays local to that user's instance of Postman. And that's really important because, and this will apply to your global variables, your collection variables, and your environment variables. But that point that I've highlighted is very important is because let's say I've defined my password and my API key in an environment, and I go and share that environment with the rest of my team. If I share that, then everyone sees my password and API key, right? Well, it depends on how you've defined it. So we want to make sure that we can specify those password and API key variables, but we don't share our password and API keys when we share our environments. So this is, and that's what sessions allow us to do. They are useful when sharing the environment or collection with variables that have sensitive data. So users working on a shared collection within a team can have their own variable values without overwriting or overriding the original value. And the way it works is when you define a variable, whether it's in an environment or globally or within a collection, you have two values. You have the initial value and the current value. The initial value is the value that will synchronize. So when you share your environment, everyone will have the initial value that you define. So anything that's sensitive, you don't want to put on the initial value. Passwords, API keys, don't specify initial values for those. What you'll do is you'll set the current value field. That current value stays local to your instance of Postman. You will see your own current value. Everyone else, when they use the same environment, will see their own current value. You can persist the current value, which means it'll replace the initial initial value with the current value for that workspace, collection, or environment. But generally, most people stick with their own current value. So you can say for password there, for the initial value, you just put a placeholder. And for the current value, you actually put in your password. And so that's how we define an environment, basically. You have your variables configured, along with their initial value and current value. So in the next exercise, we will create an environment so that we can define values for those variables that we configured previously. So we'll create an environment by clicking on this Manage Environments button on the top right-hand side. And click on Add to add a new environment. We'll call this one Open Weather Production. So we'll define the variables. So I'll start with base URL and the initial value of that is going to be that URL there, so api.openweathermap.org. And the current value will be the same as well. Now, when you paste that in, if you just tab across to the current value, it'll automatically fill out. So you don't have to paste it or type it in twice. Then we've got API version. Start with 2.5, city. This is my home city, so I'm going to put that in there. And then we have API key. Now, this is the sensitive piece of information in here. So for the initial value, I'm going to put your API key. That's the placeholder. For the current value, we'll leave that empty for the time being. So let's add that in. So there's my environment. Now, let's select the environment. So right now, I'm not using any environment, but I'm going to select my open weather production. And if I hover over these variables now, I can see what its value is. So you can see that the scope is coming from the environment that I've selected. And for this city variable, both the initial and current value is set to Sydney. There's the base URL, and there's the API key. Now, to define that API key, what I can also do 
is I can use this quick look button here next to the environment that I've selected. And this will show me the variables of my selected environment, which is the open weather production one. And on the current value, if you hover over each of these, you'll see that little pencil icon. I can click on it, and I can modify the current value directly from here. So I'm going to grab one of my API keys. Put that into the current value. Hit Enter to save. And then I will send my request. And you can see the response there. So now I've modified that, that open weather request to use variables and environments. And with that set up, I can also easily change the city that I'm doing a, a weather search for. So right now, I'm looking for the weather for Sydney, as that's what I've configured on my value. Let's just change that to something else. Let's go San Francisco. Hit send. And now I'm looking at the weather for San Francisco. If I scroll down to the bottom of this response here, you can see their name, San Fran. So that's exercise 4.2. There's two slides for that. Let me know if you have any questions. OK, I think we're good to continue now. So we've set up our environment. And so what we did just then, we had the request, and we created an environment to specify the variable values. We can also use variables within a form. Like for example here, this is the body of my request, and you can see I've specified a variable for password. So instead of hard coding my password, which is not good, I use a variable, and I'll define the value within an environment. And so that's what we'll do now. We'll go to that get auth token request that we set up previously and change the body so that instead of hard coding the password, so we're going to our RESTful Booker collection, get off token, and in, rather than hard coding the password in here, I will define a variable called password. Save that. And then to specify the password value, we will set up an environment for this. So add a new environment in here called RESTful Booker admin and define the password variable. Now, the initial value, once again, we'll make that a placeholder. So your password. And the current value is where we put the actual password in. And by the way, the API only accepts that as the password, nothing else. It's kind of hard coded in as a test. So let's select. now. One thing to just be aware of when you're sending these requests is make sure you choose the correct environment. You can choose any environment for any of your requests, but it doesn't mean that the environment is relevant to it. So for this request, for example, the open weather production is not relevant. So make sure we select the RESTful Booker admin environment, hit send, and we should still be able to get our token. So that's exercise 4.3. We good to continue? OK. So what are the best practices for using our environments? So environments are good for data that changes frequently, um, but needs to be shared across uh, people. They are encrypted at rest and at storage. So therefore, passwords and API keys should be stored in an environment. But make sure you follow those. Uh, recommendations I mentioned earlier about setting only your current value. Unless, of course, you want to actually share your password and API key with the rest of your team. And we want to use variables to minimize the number of requests that we need to have in a collection. So we, what we want to avoid is having requests with the same endpoints or same request URI, but having a, a different parameter. Like, for example, this one here. See, on the left-hand side, we have whether Question, uh, Q equals Sydney, whether Q equals Melbourne, Perth, 
all these are a separate request. We don't want that because these are essentially the same requests. The only difference is the parameter value. And there are, in this case, there will be like an infinite possible number of parameter values. So what you want instead is q equals to a variable called city. And then you can change the value of that variable within your environment. Or if you're doing more extensive testing, you can use a data file to basically upload a whole bunch of test values and test that, a test that API endpoint against those different parameter values. We looked at environment variables, but we can also define variables globally. So a global variable contains a value that is defined across the entire workspace. And this is good for storing information that doesn't really change that often, but is used repetitively. Like, say, for example, if you need to provide a user ID as part of your request, you, you don't want to have to keep defining that user ID, so you can use a global variable for it. And where you define these is basically you go to Manage Environments. And down at the bottom, you'll see a button that says Globals. So we just click on that. And it's done in exactly the same way as we define our environment variables. You have your variable, initial, and current value. If you wanted to find collection variables, you can go and edit the collection. And there's a variables tab. So you can specify your variables within that tab. Yes. Yeah, so when you define global variables and collection variable, it still follows the same rule for initial value and current value. Only the initial value is synchronized. So if you share that collection with other people, uh, well, with another workspace, everyone who sees that collection only sees the initial value. Current value is only for yourself. So a quick review. So variables minimize the number of requests that need to be defined. And we, environments are one of the possible places where we can define the values for those variables. And they're ideal for changing data within a request. And very importantly, when the same variable is defined in multiple scopes, like let's say we define the same variable in an environment and we define it globally, the value of the narrower scope takes precedence. So environment takes precedence over collection and global. Any questions? All right. So next up, we have some basic API testing using JavaScript. So in this module, we're going to describe what's involved in testing our APIs and how we can use Postman for that. And we'll look at writing some basic tests within, uh, in JavaScript. But if you don't know any JavaScript, don't panic. We don't actually have to write any actual code. We're primarily going to be using code snippets that are available for us. So why do we test APIs? Well, testing is always important in any form of software development, and especially for APIs, because the APIs are the interface to our application logic. They form a critical contract in the systems that we build. If there is a bug in our API, it can affect many API consumers and many different applications. So we want to obviously test our APIs to identify any potential problems earlier in our development cycle and fix them before we affect everyone else. But what do we generally test for with APIs? It's four things here. So functionality. We check that the API behaves as we expect. So we send a request, and we verify that we get the response that we're after. If I'm sending a request for the bookings endpoint, I need to make sure that I get a list of my bookings and that the data that we get back is correctly formatted as well. We check for performance. So make sure that we get that response within a certain time constraint. I need to make sure that the response comes back in under x number of milliseconds. And if it's over that, then we have a performance issue. Check for reliability, making sure that the API is up and available for consumers, that there's no doubt, that the downtime is minimized. And security, making sure that we don't allow 
unauthorized access and usage, and also checking permissions for different sets of users. Some users might only be able to um, do get operations on the API. Some users might only be able to access a certain subset of our API endpoints. Other users might be able to do both read and write operations. So we want to test for those different permission sets as well. So in Postman, what we can do is we can execute some JavaScript code after we have sent our request. And we execute that code against the response that we receive. The, when we write our tests, we have access to the request, the response, and the variable data. So the Postman, th this code runs in the Postman Sandbox API. And this Sandbox API gives us a set of JavaScript variables and functions to access our request and response data. The test results, in your response, you then look at the test results tab, and it will show you the results of each test case that you write. To write that basic API test, our test cases are defined by using the pm.test function. Each test requires a test name and also a set of assertions. So in this example here, the test name is status code is 200. And our assertion is basically that our response code is a HTTP 200 uh, code. So we use this pm.expect function there, looking at the response code equaling to 200. Assertions are basically just a Boolean expression at a point in the program which will return true unless the program behaves in a different way to what we expect. So I assert that the value that we want for the city is Sydney, and if I get something else in my response instead, then that assertion is false, and therefore my tests will fail, because that's not the behavior I was expecting. So basically, assertions are used to encapsulate our test logic and test for expected behavior. We write these assertions by using the PM expect function. So this is a, a generic assertion function. It's based on the Chai JS library, and it handles assertions from our responses and our variables. And things that we can do will be check for the status code of a response, like different different um, requests. You might you might be expecting a different response code, like 200 or maybe a 301. Check for the values of your JSON fields, assuming that you're getting your responses in JSON. You want to check a particular field, making sure that you're getting some uh, value that you expect. You might also check for response headers, like making sure that you get a certain response header and that that response header has a certain value to it. So those are examples of things that you can do uh, or test for. Now, as I mentioned before, if you don't know any JavaScript, that's fine. There is there are code snippets available for us for commonly used test logic. So a lot of the common tests or common things that people might want to test for, you can just use that code snippet, insert that into your test script, and just modify the bits and pieces that are necessary. And we'll start with a very simple example of a test case. So we'll go to that get weather by city request in our open weather API. And we're simply going to test for a status code. That um, um, the status code that we're checking for is a 200. So, in my get weather by city request, I will go into tests. And to write this test, if you look at the snippets, which is on the right-hand side there, scroll down. The one that we want to use is that one that says code is 200. And you can see, as soon as I click on that snippet, it inserts the test in there for me. So we have this pm.test function that represents our test case. Here's the name, status code is 200. And then the assertion is just pm.response to have status 200. Obviously, if you want to test for a different response code, all you need to do is change that number to something else and maybe change the title as well. But that's all I need. I'll save it and send. Oh, ah. Common mistake here. I don't have the correct environment selected. We want to make sure that we're using our open weather production environment since we're back on the open weather collection now. So send. And 
here's the response. The status is 200. And if I look at test results, for each test case, there will be an indication of a pass or a failure. So here, the status code is 200. That test case here has passed. This title comes from the title of your function. So that's a very simple test case there. So we'll go through this exercise, and at the end of this, we'll take another break. <laughs>